except breeds. I'm going to start out and I'm going to go over eight very common horse breeds and then once we get through that we go through a little bit of the history of the breed characteristics that identify as well as coat colors that can be registered with the breed registries then we're going to drop into coat colors of horses and hit a basic um, genetics lesson and going through the different coat colors that horses can have to say i'm excited to get to talk about genetics and coat colors would definitely be an understatement With that being said, we're going to go ahead and get started with our breeds of horses. The first breed that we have is the American Quarter Horse. The Quarter Horse was most likely informally raced for years before it was documented in early settlement times. When racing was completed in our earliest records, when it was still informal, they didn't have racetracks set up or long straight roads um, or a significant space where they could race their horses. So oftentimes these horses were raced for a quarter mile and only two horses were raced at a time. These short races required a horse capable of a flat gallop from a standing start and the modern quarter horse took its name from these quarter mile races. In 1940, the AQHA was established and to this day is the largest breed registry in the world. The American Quarter Horse is characterized by having a fine head, small alert ears, and a muscular neck of medium length. Short through the back with a long rounded croup and particularly muscular thighs. A shoulder that is long and sloping and a chest that is deep and wide. There are 17 recognized colors in the breed, and most common is the sorrel. And photographed in the right corner with the American Quarter Horse Association logo is a sorrel horse. Our next breed that we have is the American Paint Horse. This horse was prized by various Native American cultures, and even some cultures considered the loudly marked horses magical, and because of their considerable riding qualities, they were regarded as among the best war horses. In 1965, the American Paint Horse Association was formed, and this brought together two earlier organizations, the American Paint Stock Horse Association and the American Paint Quarter Horse Association. The paint horse is generally solid-built, muscular horse that is predispositioned to athletic endeavors. They have powerful hind quarters and, and a well-sprung rib cage. They are deep chested and have well defined withers. The American Paint Horse can be any color and white, or occasionally we do have solid paints. The Tobiano and the Avero are two categories that paint horses fall into, and they are defined according to the distribution of white across the horse. Later on, when we get into our coat coloring and genetics portion of this presentation or lecture, we will touch more on Tobianos and Averos and the difference between the two. Next, we have the Morgan horse. The Morgan horse is America's oldest breed of horse. There's much controversy of the start of the breed, but what we do know that is set in stone is the extraordinary influence of a st single stallion figure in the development of the breed. Um, figure, Justin Morgan's horse, is one that we talked about when we mentioned famous horses in history earlier on in this week. Figure was used for plowing, hunting, excuse me, plowing, hauling timber, clearing woodland, pulling carts, riding, and racing in harness, as well as under saddle, and le legend has it that he was never beaten when racing. Um, popularity of this breed declined as a larger, taller horse became more fashionable. However, in 1894, the first volume of the Morgan Horse Stud Book was published as new breeding programs were established to regain um, qualities of the original breed. Characteristics of the Morgan Horse include a beautiful quality head with broad, um, that is broad between the eyes, 
The neck is finely modeled. They're muscular and well arched. They have defined withers and compact muscular frame with a short back and a well-sprung rib cage, a deep wide chest, and a good sloping shoulder. These horses can be any color, however, oftentimes they are bay or chestnut. The thoroughbred is our next breed of interest. These horses developed from early English thoroughbred imports that were then crossbred to local stock. In 1665, America's first racetrack was built. However, this was long before our first recorded um, stud book or official breed registry. These horses have a fine, well-proportioned head with large alert ears. They have a long arched neck, well set to the body. Defined withers, well-sloped muscular shoulder with a long back. They have a wide, high chest, a sloping croup, and a high-set tail with a long, clean, and strong legs. The thoroughbred mostly is bay, chestnut, black, or gray with white markings that are very common on the face and the legs. There's much controversy on the Arabian horse and where their origin truly started and the developmental stages. Instead of going through multiple theories, I just stuck with one um, that clearly was developed by an individual who has a strong passion for the breed. And the statement was that Arabian horses are forged in the hearts of gods, powered by the furnace of the world, and shaped in the image of perfection. The Arabian horse has a delicate head with large eyes and alert ears that curve inward at the tip. An elegant neck is well set to a long sloping shoulder. They have defined withers, a short back, and deep wide chest. The croup is broad and quite flat, and the tail set is carried high. The Arabian horse can be gray, bay, black, chestnut, and occasionally you will have a roan. As for the Tennessee walking horse, this breed of horse evolved in the early 19th century as pioneers traveled west over the Appalachians to settle in Tennessee, Kentucky, and Missouri. As Tennessee was at the heart of the state, it was a major destination for these early travelers and many of who came from Virginia. The Tennessee walking horse is a gated breed which makes it comfortable to ride and accounts for its great demand early in its history. The walker is known for its four-beat running walk. It's what it's most well known for. These horses are solid and muscular, but carries itself with enormous cadence and elegance. An attractive head that is well set to an elegant arched neck with sloping shoulders and a rounded barrel. The back is compact and the hindquarters are muscular. The Tennessee walking horse can come in any color, although most often they are black and shades of chestnut. Our Clydesdale horse is a heavy draft horse. And I'm sure most of you all have seen the Budweiser Clydesdales. Um, those horses actually come into Western typically about once a year and use the Expo Center to be housed while they're traveling around. Um, but the horses, the Budweiser Clydesdale is of Clydesdale breed. They have a noble head with large wide set eyes and a well formed neck. They have defined withers and a short back leading into long muscular hindquarters. They are long in the leg with sound feet and long silky feathering on their legs. Most often they are bay or brown, however sometimes they are black, gray, roan, or chestnut with white markings on the face and legs. And our final breed that we'll be discussing today is a miniature horse. These horses can be no taller than 38 inches or they cannot be registered. Um, to put it into perspective, 
Uh, most horses that we've talked about to this point are anywhere from 14 to 17 hands. Our horses are measured in hands, which is approximately four inches. So these miniature horses that are measured in inches at 38 inches, if we were to do 38 inches divided by four, that's only nine and a half hands. So these horses are very, very small comparative to the other breeds that we've talked about today. The miniature horse is a descendant from Shetland ponies, and they were selectively inbred for their size. They are now bred with superb conformation and outstanding dispositions, and the result is a proportionate little horse that is suitable for a variety of uses, including as pets, show animals, and a form of therapy for disabled individuals, as well as guides for the blind. Now we're ready to shift gears and move into genetics and coat colors of horses. This is a 300 level course, so I, I do expect that all of you have had biology, you've had some sort of basic genetic education, and this shouldn't be introducing too many new concepts. We'll just be applying them to horses and how coat colors, how coat colors work. With that being said, I will do a basic review of different vocabulary and genetics that you must be familiar with before we get into how those interact with coat colors. If for any reason at the end of this lecture you feel like you need more information or you do need to review, when I post your assignment this week I will also post a link to an equine coat color genetics interactive website. So this website will go into detail on different colors of the horse and it will also have an interactive component that you can select to test yourself and quiz yourself on that material and content. So that will be something that I will post if you feel like you need an additional resource. And with that being said, we're going to get started with our genetics review. As a horse owner, imagine that you bred a bay horse to a bay stallion, hoping for another flashy bay because you're bringing two bays together to show. However, instead, when you have your foal, you end up with a chestnut. And so oftentimes a horse owner is going to wonder, you know, why did this happen? You know, I bred two bays, I should get a bay, right? And the answer lies in how coat color genetics interact and work together. So we're going to learn exactly how these coat colors are going to display in our horses today. A term that we need to be familiar with is a genotype. A genotype is the genetic makeup of a given physical trait. So the way that I remember this is um, genotype begins with gene, which is like genetic, so I know that's my um, genetic makeup. As for phenotype, it is the physical expression of a genetic trait. Similarly, I remember this one as phenotype, sounds like photo, which is physical expression. So that's what's displayed, that's what I can visually see. Next we have homozygous and heterozygous. Homozygous is two copies of the same allele for one gene. So the example we have here is with our extension gene, which we will talk more about once we get into coat colors. But we have two uppercase E's or two lowercase E's. So in each set, both of the alleles are the same. So this is homozygous. For heterozygous, we have one dominant and one recessive allele. So the uppercase E is our dominant allele and the lowercase E is our recessive allele. So there is one of each for our extension gene, so this is heterozygous. Next we have dominant and recessive. A dominant is when we have one copy of the mutation is needed for the trait to be expressed outwardly. So that's our, our heterozygous dominant is the example we have there. 
And then for recessive, there are two copies of the mutation are needed for the trait to be expressed outwardly. So in the example, we have a homozygous recessive example. And this brings us to our two basic coat colors. Horses are truly two different colors at the start, either red or black. And this is determined by the extension gene. The extension gene is instrumental in allowing black pigment to be expressed. And like I said, all horses are either black or red. And our red horses we know as sorrels or chestnuts. Now sorrels and chestnuts are going to be two different colors, but ultimately our sorrel and our chestnut horses have the same genetic makeup. Red is the recessive trait in this case, whereas black is dominant. So let's hit on our red or our sorrel and chestnut horses first. So saying that it's recessive, in order for a horse to be red, it has to have two lowercase e's. So it has to be recessive. Then for our black horses, with black being dominant, all black horses have at least one copy of the um, uppercase E allele. So a black horse can be either homozygous dominant, so two uppercase E's, or it can be heterozygous dominant. So that's going to be one uppercase E and one lowercase E. So here's when it gets into when we're breeding, um, you know, a black and a red horse, what color can we get? If we breed two red horses, we're going to get a red horse. If we breed a homozygous dominant horse to a red horse, we're going to get a black horse. If we breed a heterozygous dominant horse to a red horse, we have a chance of having a red horse, but we also have a chance of having a black horse, depending on um, which gene is passed on from that black horse. And all other coat colors and patterns stem from these two basic coat colors. Building upon our black and our red, we have a bay. A bay horse is going to be black, so it's going to be either heterozygous dominant or homozygous dominant for the black gene. And then it's also going to have the agouti gene. And the agouti gene controls the location of black in the horse's coat. So the agouti gene, in order for it to be turned on, which it has to be turned on for our bay horses, it's either going to be two capital A's or it's going to be a capital A and a lowercase a. So heterozygous dominant for bay. Um, bay horses can be any shade of brown with black points on the mane, tail, and lower legs. And the brown coloration can range from a light tan or a dark seal color. So essentially the difference between a bay and a black horse is going to be that the agouti gene is turned on, which limits the expression of black to the lower legs and the points on the ears, as well as the mane and tail. Moving on to the Palomino. A Palomino horse is homozygous recessive, so it is a red horse, and the agouti gene is turned off. So once more, the agouti gene is homozygous recessive, and then it has one copy of the cream gene. These horses have a golden coat color with a light or cream colored mane and tail. The coat colors can range from a light off-white shade to a deep golden brown. A Palomino horse is essentially a chestnut horse that is heterozygous for the cream dilution mutation. Next we have a buckskin. A buckskin is a black horse, so either homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant. 
And then it has the agouti gene turned on because the agouti gene limits our black pigmentation to only the lower limbs and the points. So in the agouti gene being turned on, we have a homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant. And then we have one copy of the cream gene. Body color ranges from yellowish to gold and has black points. And buckskins are similar to duns, however, buckskins do not have a dorsal stripe. So it's very important a buckskin does not have a dorsal stripe. The buckskin is essentially a bay horse that is heterozygous for the cream dilution mutation. Following that, we do have the dun. The dun horse is going to be black with the agouti gene turned on and one copy of the Dunn gene. The body color ranges from yellowish to gold. The mane and tail may be black, brown, red, yellow, white, or mixed. And Dunn horses have a dorsal stripe down their backs and some zebra striping on their forearms. So on the right hand photograph, you can see down the center of that horse's back and down through its rump, it has a dark brown stripe comparative to the color of its golden body. So this horse does have a dorsal stripe and also has some zebra striping on the forearm. So the left hand photographs shows the light zebra striping on the mid to lower um, forearms. The dun horse, a mutation behind the dun coat color is still unknown. However, what we do know it is a dominant trait affecting the horse's primary base color. Next we have a Garula. A Garula horse is black with the Agouti gene turned off and one copy of the Dunn gene. The body color is often described as a smoky or mousy color and Garula horses often have a dorsal stripe and, um, and zebra striping and black points on the lower legs. A horse with a, a gorilla is a horse with a black base color and the dun mutation would allow it to have a gorilla coat color. Next we have a gray horse. A gray horse is born dark and will eventually lose the color pigment in their hair until they are all or nearly white. So each year a gray horse is going to progressively get lighter. To produce a gray horse, at least one parrot must contribute a dominant gray gene. A non-gray horse has two recessive genes for gray. The gray gene masks any other base coat for all colors. Our roan horses are oftentimes confused with grays. Um, however, there is most certainly a difference. The gray and roan horses can look similar, but the net genetics behind the two are very different. Instead of lightening in color over time, roan horses retain dark colored heads and legs and have a mixture of white and colored hairs over the rest of the body. The roan gene gives the horse a uniform mixture of white hairs on its body. The exact mutation behind the roan coloring has yet to be identified, according to a 2013 publication. Um, in the photographs on the left-hand side, this horse is known as a blue roan, so it's a black horse with a roan gene. And on the right-hand side, we have a red roan, which is oftentimes referred to as a strawberry roan. So strawberry roan and red roan can be used interchangeably. And this is a red horse with a roan gene. The horse on the right hand side is actually my foal um, that my mare Holly had this May, May 12th to be exact actually. So she's rolling right up on four months old here pretty soon. Um, but I couldn't miss an opportunity to show off my filly as well as kind of talk about how those genetics work. So the breeding that I did um, for this mare, I have a catalyst, a mare that is bay, and then I bred her to yellow roan of Texas, 
which is a Palomino roan. So with that comes the fact that, you know, blue roan and red roan, those aren't the only color roans that you can have. Um, you can also have a bay roan, a Palomino roan, among other colors. Um, so I bred a bay horse to a Palomino roan, and I ended up with a red roan. So what that can tell me is I know that a Palomino horse is going for our extension gene is going to have two lowercase e's, so be red, and then a bay horse is a black horse with the agouti gene turned on. But a black horse can be homozygous dominant or heterozygous dominant. Um, clearly, since I have a roan filly on the ground, and that's going to determine that my bay mare is going to be heterozygous dominant. So she's going to be a uppercase E and a lowercase E. And the gene that she passed on to this foal is the lowercase E because this foal is red. So we know that she has um, homozygous recessive, two lowercase E's for her extension gene. So that's a little bit on how those genes interact and how just because you're, you're breeding you know, a Palomino to a bay, you can end up with a red horse. Um, with that being said, there is a large amount of genetic testing that can be done. We can do genetic testing for colors. We can do it for, for behavioral components. We can do it for um, what's most commonly done is our five panel test. So that is five common genes that cause specific mutations and diseases within our horses. Um, so lots of genetic testing that can be done to tell us more about our horses in the early stages. Next we have our Appaloosa horse. A Appaloosa is also a breed of horse and they have some very unique characteristics. The pattern can appear on any type of base coat color um, and the characteristics that make the breed unique include molted skin, especially around the muzzle and genitalia, as well as white sclera, um, which is the outer ring around the eye, and vertically striped hooves. The Appaloosa comes in four different pattern types. There's a leopard, a snowflake, a blanket, and a varnished roan Appaloosa. The leopard has dark spots all over a light coat color. The snowflake has large light spots all over a dark base coat. A blanket has white on the hips and loins with or without spots. So that's the photograph we have in the right hand corner is a blanket Appaloosa. And finally we have a varnish roam. A varnished roan has white hairs mixed in the base coat and white areas are patchy and concentrated around the rump and the back. And finally we have our paint coat colors. So we talked about those earlier on when we talked about breeds that the American paint horse is a breed of horse. They have two different recognized coat colors. We have or um, coat characteristics, design, specific um, that are recognized, and that is the Overo and the Tobiano. The Tobiano, to start off with, is the dominant color pattern and tends to be the most common pattern in paint horses. They generally have dark colored heads with white legs and white patches breaking over the animal's top line. Horses with this dominant gene will always produce a spotted horse. Next we have the Overo. The Overo is shown on the left hand side of the photograph below and it is characterized by a mostly solid colored horse with white horizontal patches on the side of the neck and or belly. However, white does not cross over the withers. Overo horses are commonly have a bald face, and the white patterns are irregular, splashy, or spotty. Overo is a word that is derived from Spanish, 
in which its original meaning was like an egg, in which the white on the horse is splashy or egg-like and irregular. The color is produced by a mutation on the gene EDNRB. No need for you to know that specific gene, um, but it is produced by a mutation on that gene. And when two recessive ovaro horses um, can produce a foal that has lethal white syndrome, OLWS. So that is going to be our lethal white foal syndrome. In these foals, the colon doesn't develop normally and foals are unable to pass manure. Affected foals will die and or be euthanized within a few days of birth. And since the mutation that causes this is known, breeders can test mares and stallions to, produce, to reduce the risk of producing an affected foal. Um, so that was, like I said, we do, can do five panel um, testing in horses and it's oftentimes done in breeding to make sure that we're not breeding horses that are going to have one of these um, five commonly, commonly known um, traits. And so one of those is the lethal white syndrome. That's one of the five. But we will talk about that more when we hit on breeding later on in the semester. A caution to breeders and individuals that are seeking these per se fancy coat colors that these mutations that cause those desirable colors can have other undesirable effects. Another example is that horses that are homozygous for the Appaloosa mutation are affected by congenital stationary night blindness, which it causes a complete lack of night vision. Um, so with that being said, if you look back historically, um, even prior to when horses were dominated, but in early, uh, not dominated, um, domestication. So early on, prior to horses' domestication or as they were first being domesticated, that those wild horse herds, oftentimes you're going to have bay horses primarily. Um, but you're also going to have, you know, your solids. You're going to have bays and sorrels and blacks. But a lot of the times you're not going to have these standout colors, these super flashy colors that we have today. There's a couple of theories and a couple of uh, articles you can read on, you know, why this is. But ultimately, in the wild, these horses are predators and these flashy and these standout colors, you know, they're easily noticed. And so it was very quickly um, through survival of the fittest that we did have our common colors, our bay, our sorrels, our blacks, those colors that, that blended well together. And moving on from our coat colors, we will now talk about facial markings. And um, we won't talk about the genetics or the genes that cause these, but I do want you to be able to identify these facial and leg markings that we go over. Starting on the far left-hand side in the center of our horse's forehead, we have a star. Moving over, we have a uh, stripe or a strip. So this is going to be a thin white line um, going all the way from the forehead down to the muzzle of the horse, so very thin. Then we have a blaze. So a blaze is gonna be a broader facial marking from the forehead to the nose. And then we have a snip. A snip is a white marking that is only on, on the lower the nose portion of this horse. And then the far right, we have a horse with a bald face. So that white is going to extend um, beyond the eyes. So with all of that being said, um, we can have horses that have a combination of facial markings. So we can have a horse that has a star and a snip or a star, a strip, and a snip. So if the facial markings are not connected, um, then we can have a couple of different facial markings within one. So we'll work on identifying some of those when we have our lab time later on. Let's see, Wednesday is when our lab is going to be, Wednesday at 4. So we'll go through and identify some of our coat colors and also facial markings. And next we have our leg markings. On the, starting on the top left, we have a stocking, then a sock, then a fetlock. And on the bottom, starting on the left-hand side, we have a pastern, a cornet, and a partial pastern. 
So with that being said, it's helpful if you know some of the basic anatomy of the horse when identifying these leg markings. Um, for example, on the upper far right hand side with our fetlock, this white marking is going to extend um, up to the fetlock. And then moving down to the bottom left with the pastern, um, this white marking is not going to extend to the fetlock, but instead it's going to remain only on the pastern of that horse. In the center on the left with our cornet, our coronary band or cornet is going to be where our hoof and the horse's skin and hair meets. So the cornet is just white right there where that cornet band is. So that's just a little bit of the anatomy that helps with identifying these different leg markings. And with that being said, that is the conclusion of our lecture, um, our second lecture for week two, and you are ready to start your 2B assignment. With that being said, as you complete these assignments each week, it is to make sure that everyone's keeping up and you're watching your lectures and you're prepared for your lab time, but it's also going to help you in preparing for your test. You'll be able to learn some of the question styles that will be asked on the test. That's not to say that I'm going to ask you the exact same question on the test. Um, the wording may be reversed or flipped or asked about a different color. So stay on your toes there, but it will help you to um, kind of understand where I'm coming from and kind of what information that I'm looking for you all to learn throughout the course. So with that being said, you're ready to get started for assignment 2B for this week, and I will see you guys in lab on Wednesday at 4 o'clock.